Hi, everybody. I'm Angela Unk, and uh, this is the 40th episode of the Clemens Bookworm. I'm really amazed and excited about that. And thank you so much for joining us today. Today's meeting is indeed being recorded to share online. And this afternoon, you will receive an email with the recording and the resources mentioned in today's broadcast. Just in case there's anyone who's joining us for the first time or needs a reminder about how we use Zoom for this program, we certainly encourage you to chime in to the chat. We love the camaraderie of being together, even if it is virtual. So if you can change the setting to everyone that uh, keeps the conversation going. In order for us to keep track of the questions, however, please use the Q&A section. And there you can also give a thumbs up if it's a question that you have and it will upvote that question. We do have the live machine captions turned on today as part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion program. You can toggle those on or off. You can change the size and you can even move it around if you would rather have it in a different location. I have enabled side-by-side -side mode, so that should allow you to see both the speaker and the slides. Um, you'll see that there's a little separator to change the relative size of each slide. And then you can play around. I can only um, control so much of what you see. So play around so that you get a, a good picture of what you would like to see. And uh, remember that you can also zoom in on uh, Paul's slides if there's portions of them that you'd like to take a closer look at. As always, Anne and Tracy will be monitoring the chat and providing helpful reminders and links. I'd like to take this opportunity to mention that Tracy's, this is Tracy's last bookworm. Um, she'll be transitioning to the Michigan Humanities Collaborator Collaboratory within LSA as their new collaboratory coordinator. Tracy's imagination and organization were instrumental in making the bookworm a success. So I hope you'll join me in wishing her well. Thanks, Tracy. This program is brought by William L. Clements Library on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The Clements Library enables the discovery, learning, and teaching of American history through the collection, conservation, digitization, and availability of primary sources on paper. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the University of Michigan is located on the territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations made the largest single land donation to the University of Michigan, offered ceremonially as a gift in the text of the Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids, so that their children could be educated in a Western manner. We acknowledge the history of native displacement that allowed the University of Michigan to be founded, and today we reaffirm contemporary and ancestral Anishinaabek ties to this land and their profound contributions to this institution. The William L. Clements Library acknowledges that it has and continues to benefit from the original land dispossession and established hierarchies of settler colonialism. We always start the bookworm with a poll. Um, and get us thinking and talking about today's topic and how it might relate to us. So I'm going to end the poll and share the results. And um, I'm pretty sure that everyone on this program likes books and spends time looking at them and gathering them in a variety of ways. So you'll see that library is actually beating all of the others out, which is a wonderful way to have piles of books without them overtaking your whole house. Um, but bookstore and online are close seconds. Uh, 
So, and of course, borrowing from a friend or family member sometimes is not so much borrowing as them um, dropping off and running away when they're trying to get rid of books. Um, <laughs> at least that's what I've found sometimes. Okay, so uh, should be fun to hear more from Paul today about, um, whoops, sorry, stop my share, about buying books during another time. Um, so it's my pleasure at this point to welcome Paul back to the bookworm. Paul Erickson is the Randolph G. Adams Director of the Clements Library. And today's topic is the varieties of retail experience or buying books in 19th century America. Paul joined the Clements Library in January of 2020. He received his BA in English from the University of Chicago and an MA and PhD in American Studies from the University of Texas at Austin. Paul has experience working in publishing, the nonprofit sector, and management consulting, as well, of course, as the special collections library world. All right, Paul, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Angela and Ann and Tracy. And um, Tracy, we wish you well in your new ventures. I'm going to share my screen, um, which is always a hair raising venture. Oh, you have, now screen sharing is disabled. Um, oh, no. Well, um, I can fix that. So uh, I also want to thank some people who've been uh, exceptionally helpful in helping me think about um, uh, this talk, uh, generations of colleagues at the American Antiquarian Society, Erica Piola at the Library Company of Philadelphia, uh, and particularly Clayton Lewis here at the Clements. Um, and before I start, I want to say a quick word about why I'm interested in um, this topic. So and I'm gonna, now I'm going to share my screen. There we go. Um, and... Or, um, can you, okay, so, um, you know, shopping for books is something we all enjoy. It seems like a fun topic. Um, I think it's a little more than that. So it's, it's pretty obvious that where we buy things shapes what we buy. So in the case of books, if you only bought books from a bookstore in an airport, you'd wind up reading a very different body of literature than you would if you only bought books at Target or a campus bookstore or your local independent bookshop. Um, and a lot of Americans have a deep-rooted belief that books are different uh, from things like shoes or pickles, um, and that what we buy or borrow are generally thought to have an influence on how we think and what we believe in a way that shoes and pickles don't. Um, this assumption that books have a particular kind of power is what underlies the work of people on both sides of the current debate uh, about removing particular books from school curricula and libraries. We're convinced that books have an impact on the minds of students, uh, and so we fight over what we want those students to learn and what kind of people we hope they'll become. Um, and that same argument extends to the area of bookstores as well. So I, I think that um, thinking about where and how readers in the past bought things to read is just as serious as it is fun. And this talk has roots in questions that have been on my mind for a long time about how everyday people in the 19th century United States bought stuff to read. So I'm not interested here in book collectors and bibliophiles, um, but, uh, or, or even you know, really wealthy people, but just sort of everyday folks. And I'm not just interested in books because it's clear that many readers spent far more time reading newspapers and magazines uh, and ephemeral pamphlet novels uh, and the like um, than they did uh, reading bound books. But it has its more immediate roots uh, in a particular artifact uh, held at the American Antiquarian Society where I used to work. And I'll get to that part in a bit. But since all of you are lovers of books and many of you are collectors, I assume this means that all of you are avid buyers of books as the, the poll indicated. So all of you know that few retail sectors of our economy have been as drastically transformed by the shift to online commerce as has the retail book trade, both new and used. Um, and in a not unrelated phenomenon, there are perhaps no businesses uh, about which contemporary American consumers are more sentimental than bookstores. Um, and it always goes back to the issue of how, how bookstores smell for a lot of people. Um, and all of us have in our mind's eye our own platonic ideal of the bookstore, and there are key elements that probably come up for all of us. So winding rows of shelves, places to sit and read, maybe some music. Some people like a cat in a bookstore. I do not. Um, 
And all of us probably have memories uh, of becoming aware of the world of books as a place where we could spend a significant portion of our lives thanks to early encounters with bookstores. That's certainly the case for me. The bookstores that I got to know growing up in the Twin Cities fostered my love of books um, and gave shape to my understanding of what the world of books was. And as a result of the importance of these encounters with bookstores in any avid reader's past, I think there's an unavoidable tendency to sentimentalize bookstores and books. And particularly as uh, small independent bookstores, and this is uh, local landmark literati here in Ann Arbor, began to lose market share first to mall-based uh, bookstores like E. Dalton Walden Books, and then big box retailers like Barnes and Noble, Noble and Borders, and then to certain online behemoths. Um, people responded to these changes in a way that's often rooted in an assumption that the model of book buying that was going away, so that small local independent bookstore, was the way things had always been. That was the way that people had always bought books. So I got interested in the history of how Americans bought stuff to read because I wanted to know how we'd gotten to the state that seemed to be so rapidly vanishing. So I'm gonna start with a specific example and then move to a more general perspective. Um, and I should say at the outset that although I'm really interested in how people bought books, we have very little information from people writing about their book buying experiences. So the, the best way to get at how people would have bought books is to uh, look at bookstores and information from people who sold books. So that's a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about. And the core questions I've been thinking about in this talk um, for a long time, as I said, were sparked, were sparked by two things. One was an extended period that I spent doing research on antebellum American pornography. Almost all of the indictments and other materials that I read in various municipal archives about prosecutions of people for selling sexually explicit materials in antebellum cities contain a, a description of how and where these things were being sold that offer very specific descriptions of a particular kind of retail interaction. The person who filed the report, who was usually a police officer, typically gave a very detailed description of the physical setting of the retail exchange, whether it was in a hotel lobby or at a street newsstand or in the back room of a bookstore. The other thing that has shaped how I think about these questions is, is a particular item in the collections of the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester. It's a scrapbook compiled by a man named Davis Lawler James, who is the son of a Cincinnati publisher and bookseller, Uriah P. James, and, and uh, the son, Davis James, took over his father's bookstore. Uh, in the late 19th century. This scrapbook is made up of newspaper and magazine clippings, copies of trade cards, letters, meeting minutes that are all pasted into a copy of a big book about the Paris Peace Conference that ended World War I. So it's this big, thick, uh, sort of untidy, overstuffed scrapbook. Almost all the items in the scrapbook deal in one way or another with the book trade in Ohio, which was James's real interest. The particular clipping that set me down this path is an article from the bookseller, uh, a book trade periodical, most likely from 1899. Uh, this brief article evaluates the leading book dealers in Columbus. The author noted, my canvas of the trade made manifest a condition that is inspiring and argues well for the future. Leading dealers in Columbus are, and here you see the list of the leading book dealers in Columbus. So Columbus in 1900 was a rapidly growing city of about 125,000 people, up from uh, 88,000 in 1890. It was the fourth largest city in Ohio. Um, so, and this list of the thriving city's leading booksellers includes 10 businesses, um, four of which are newsstands down there at the bottom, three of which are in hotels and one's at the train station. The anonymous uh, evaluator praised various stores for their enterprising spirit or their attractive appearance. Quote, the best window display here is made by McClellan. Although I'm sure Reidner would make the best show if he had the opportunity, Thra keeps a large variety of periodicals and makes the best show in this line. The author then went on to add, Thra is a one-armed man who keeps a barbershop and attends strictly to business. J.F. Reidner occupies a big basement and for the place makes an excellent show. I think he is the most enterprising bookseller in Columbus. All the hotel newsstands pay more attention to cigars than to any other line. The same scrapbook contains several obituaries of a man named J.R. Hawley, who was one of the leading periodical dealers in Cincinnati, uh, who died in 1904. The obituaries recount how his bookstore, uh, and they all call it a bookstore, um, uh, even though in the city directories he was listed as a news dealer, which is a different category. Um, his bookstore, which opened in 1861, was a frequent stop for US presidents when they were visiting Cincinnati. Every president from Johnson to McKinley stopped into Grandpa Hawley's bookstore. Another obituary uh, claimed that he carried one of the largest and most diversified stocks of reading matter in the United States. 
Yet they also hinted at other lines of business. One, one obituary noted that his bookstore was for many years the headquarters of the sporting celebrities who came to Cincinnati. Grandpa Holly was agent for the A.G. Spalding Company and supplied the Reds with their uniforms. Thus, we see bookstores in late 19th century Ohio also serving as barbershops, cigar stores, and outfitters of professional baseball teams, which are not the things that we usually expect bookstores to do. Or was it the other way around? If three of the leading book dealers in Columbus were more concerned with selling cigars than books, are they really leading book dealers? Why don't we call them leading cigar dealers who also sold books? To which business was the one-armed LT Thraw strictly attending, that of cutting hair uh, or selling books? So I'm interested in turning the question around to think about what for consumers made a store a bookstore. That is what did customers expect a retail environment where they purchased reading material to look like and to feel like? How did they experience the places where they purchased printed material? How many people actually bought things to read from what modern readers and too many scholars have come to idealize as the uh, independent American bookstore? Um, so here are two examples of the UP James business in Cincinnati. So this is what we think of when we talk about a bookstore, right? A street level retail outlet with window displays um, showing recent titles that has books on a wide range of topics from numerous publishers that have shelves that you can browse. Um, although as is the case with many bookstores, um, shelves were not as easily browsable as we might think. This is the, the later version of the James bookstore from about 1903. These stores are staffed by knowledgeable salespeople who are available to answer questions from customers and help them make good decisions. They have multiple books in different genres, allowing readers to compare titles and select the book that best meets their needs. Such businesses might sell stationery or pens or other items associated with a writing and reading life, but they're fundamentally single sector uh, retail outlets. If this is what modern readers and scholars have come to think of as a bookstore, it's at least in part due to the hard work of booksellers in the past who worked diligently, particularly in the late 19th century in the face of price competition from other types of retailers to precisely define what a bookstore should be and to stake out ground for the selling of books as a profession, not just another mode of shopkeeping. An 1875 illustrated guidebook of Cincinnati described this local bookstore. Um, not coincidentally, um, this bookstore was uh, the one owned by the publisher of the guidebook um, as being, quote, fitted up in the most complete manner. Upon the shelves in the retail department, the visitor will find new and standard works in every branch of literature. They make their store a resort for lovers of books, whether they wish to purchase or not, right? So it's this idea that you can go into a bookstore and, and just look at things and you don't have to buy stuff. In 1893, the, the bibliographer Adolf, Adolf Grohl, who worked for Publishers Weekly in an insanely detailed uh, guide titled The Profession of Bookselling, offered specific details on how a bookstore ought to be arranged. And this is a, a fairly long quote. The shelves should be easily accessible to the customer and never should counters or any other obstruction be placed in front of them that would in the least convey to the mind of the book buyer that the shelves are forbidden territory. Customers in general and book buyers in particular are naturally timid and diffident in a store and fearful of getting into places where they are not welcome. And all are more or less impressed with the fact that by tradition, the space behind counters and tables is sacred to the storekeeper and his clerks. Do all you can to disabuse the minds of your patrons of this notion and let it be widely known that all are allowed free access to every part of your store. So the bookstore was to be filled with shelves that are open to browsing, not with a clerk behind a counter as, as in most grocery or dry goods stores. Uh, and this is the, the model of the book, the earlier model of the bookstore and, uh, that, that Grohl is sort of pushing back against. Um, the spatial organization was of paramount importance to Grohl, who referred to the warring of the counter on the shelf, the foraging of the novelty man on the harvest of the bookseller. Um, so this is, uh, this picture is from 1836. It's the earlier model of how shops were arranged. Um, uh, what what Grohl in, in the 1890s is really arguing against um, oh, uh, is the large, um, large department store, um, uh, like department stores like Macy's, which had large book departments staffed with people who were just cashiers who didn't know anything about the books, or, or so he said. And the stock of a bookstore was to be varied, covering all branches of literature. Grohl cautioned booksellers against becoming, quote, identified with but one class of literature, for his limit of growth will soon be reached. Books of advice for traveling subscription book agents um, who were uh, a different category of enemies of booksellers like Grohl also nodded to the notion that variety of stock was part of what made a bookstore a bookstore. 
One such manual from 1865 noted that it is always desirable for traveling book agents to be supplied with a selection of publications from which the purchaser or examiner may make a choice. We do not mean by this that every canvasser should be supplied with a various assortment such as an actual bookstore would exhibit. Um, uh, but if he is mainly depending upon the sale of one particular work of a pop popular character, and quote, he should have more books that he can sell to readers who may not be interested in that specific thing. Um, so it's the idea that, that for something to be a bookstore, it has to have lots of different books in lots of different categories. It can't be narrowly uh, circumscribed. So who were booksellers in the 19th century? Well, if you listen to the booksellers themselves, uh, quote, the retail bookseller is an educator and a blessing to any community in which he may be placed. William Brotherhead in his memoir about uh, his career spent in the old book trade in Philadelphia, claimed that the bookseller, quote, must have high qualifications besides the mere objective merits of the general tradesman. The first requisite is a thorough knowledge of literature. He should be a cyclopedia, able to answer questions about the general nature of books and their authors. Uh, Adolf Grohl set the bar even higher. Uh, he wrote that booksellers would regularly be confronted with emergencies of knowledge and would be expected to come to the rescue. They must be prepared to make informed recommendations to such specific questions as, what have you of the Elizabethan dramatists and which are considered the best, omitting Shakespeare? Or, I have such and such a work on the geology of South Carolina, but I want something more descriptive, especially of the Southern portion. And I'm pretty certain that never in the history of bookselling has a customer come into a bookstore and ask that question. It is only through, quote, long and conscientious training, much reading and study and constant application that a bookseller will be able to lead readers quote, away from pernicious and frivolous literature to books of a more solid, enduring character. It may almost be said that he even takes the illiterate and makes of them intelligent and aspiring citizens, right? So it's this idea that booksellers aren't there just to sell you the books that you want, they're, they're there to shape your taste and uh, make you buy the books that they think you need. Writers like Brotherhead and Grohl went to great lengths to distinguish booksellers from mere merchants, especially quote, illiterate girls and cash boys, the ill-paid slaves of the counter, like this guy here. Um, some people, Grohl writes, would quote, undoubtedly classify book selling with the ordinary mercantile business, asserting with some show of correctness that the book business is the handling of merchandise, pure and simple, like hardware, household utensils and the like. But the flat iron or the bedstead or the scrap basket speak for themselves and need no explanation from the salesman as to their purposes. But this is not so with a book. Brotherhead was even more dismissive of general merchants. Quote, a grocer sells his candles, a tailor fits his customer, a dry goods man sells his goods. The qualifications required in each of the above departments are of a general mediocre character, such as anyone with ordinary brains can soon learn. A few months are generally sufficient. These, these fake booksellers, according to Grohl, quote, sell books as merchandise by size and quantity, together with produce and novelties. And some authors held a similarly, similarly exalted view of, of the kinds of places where they hoped their books would be sold. One prominent juvenile author who's identi unidentified writing in Publishers Weekly in 1876 complained of her latest book, quote, selling very rapidly at a certain store in New York where everything can be bought from furniture to dolls shoes. I was surprised to hear that it was for sale there at all. And, and this author, I think, is pretty clearly talking about a department store, whether it's Macy's or, or one of the other um, 19th century New York department stores. But does this ideal model of the bookstore presented by these booksellers fit with how readers in the 19th century actually bought stuff to read? How many people ever went into that kind of a bookstore where their loopy questions about South Carolina geology would find a sympathetic and knowledgeable ear? Outside of big cities, the number was negligible. Um, and, the, and the type of book buying that Grohl lamented, where people shopped for books alongside groceries and novelties, was actually very much the norm, um, rather than the exception. Big city bookstores in the 19th century were built on a very specific model. Um, one reflected here in this image of the Temple of the Muses, uh, one of the first great bookstores of London, which opened in 1793 and which sold both new and used books in all genres. Um, and part of its grand opening celebration to show how big the store was, um, was that they drove a, uh, a coach drawn by four horses into the bookstore and went around this central island counter because um, uh, there was so much space. Early American cities weren't big enough to support bookstores on the scale. And 18th century bookshops often sold books alongside other specialized selections of goods, uh, often musical instruments. 
But with the arrival of steam-powered publishing in the 1830s and 40s and the resulting tidal wave of cheap prints uh, that accompanied the country's first increase in, in uh, urban growth, American cities could finally support bookstores of the sort that London had had for about 50 years. The colossally productive Middlebrow publisher T.B. Peterson opened a new bookstore in, the early, in Philadelphia in the early 1850s and described it in great detail in promotional text on the back cover of this novel um, by the sentimentalist Timothy Shea Arthur. And thanks to Garrett Scott here in Ann Arbor for these images. And this whole text on the back cover of this book is a description of the bookstore. It's very long. Um, I'll quote from it at length because um, it's really quite something. T.B. Peterson has the satisfaction to announce to the public that he is removed to the new and spacious Brownstone building, number 102 Chestnut Street, known as the most central and best situation in the city of Philadelphia. As it is the model bookstore of the country, we will describe it. It is the largest, most spacious, and best arranged retail and wholesale cheap book and publishing establishment in the United States. It is built of Connecticut sandstone in a richly ornamented style. The whole front of the lower story, except that taken up by the doorway, is occupied by two large plate glass windows, a single plate to each window, costing together over $3,000. On entering and looking up, you find above you a ceiling 16 feet high, while on gazing before, you perceive a vista of 157 feet. The retail counters extend back for 80 feet, and being double, afford counter room of 160 feet in length. There is also over 3,000 feet of shelving in the retail part of the store alone. This part is devoted to the retail business, and as it is the most spacious in the country, furnishes also the best and largest assortment of all kinds of books to be found in the country. It is fitted up in the most superb style. The shelvings are all painted in Florence white with gilded cornices for the bookshelves. And it goes on and on talking about behind the retail part of the store, there's the counting room, which has a stained glass dome. And then behind that, there's a 60 foot long packing department with counters for books that are being shipped out. And then the basement of the building is full of copies of Peterson's books so that the, the entire store in its basement contained 300,000 volumes. Um, so I haven't been able to find an image of the interior of Peterson, Peterson's store, unfortunately. But here we can see the exterior. Um, and we can see that Mr. Peterson left a couple things out, not least the fact that his store occupies only half of the ground floor of this building at 102 Chestnut Street um, uh, that also has the Goodyear Rubber Company. Nevertheless, we do have images of some contemporary bookstores that can give a sense of what Peterson's store might have looked like, uh, such as this interior G.G. Evans gift bookstore um, from 1860, or probably a closer analog, this, 1850, uh, oh, uh, this 1856 image um, of Appleton's bookstore in New York. Um, and you see that how grand the interior of this bookstore is. And while you can see that this is, a, this is a very elaborate retail space, it's also clearly limited to a certain kind of customer, right? These are genteel readers. They're very well dressed with the leisure time and disposable income to buy books. Um, here's another uh, image of a smaller Philadelphia um, book and stationery store that gives a sense of, of what the street presence of these kinds of bookstores was like. And it's the Grigg and Elliott store is, the, the store in the middle, it's the first one with white shutters. Um, and this is a, a later image um, of, of what the interior of a shop like that might've looked like. This is William Murphy and Sons also in Philadelphia who sold, who made blank books and stationery um, and also sold books and had their print shop in the basement of, of the building. So mo most urban readers would not have dared set foot in a store like this or like Peterson's. Um, but instead would have bought reading material from stores like these. So this is Young's uh, bookshop in Philadelphia, you know, a, a smaller, um, a little more rundown building, um, the corner bookshop in Gloucester, Massachusetts. You see all the posters there on the outside uh, advertising new books, um, new publications, or this uh, image of Swain's corner bookshop in Brooklyn. So these stores kind of spilled out onto the sidewalk and had kiosks and, and sidewalk shelves um, for shoppers to browse. And it's important to note, note that all of these stores were primarily retail outlets of larger publishing enterprises, whether they printed newspapers or blank books or a combination, they weren't just standalone bookstores. Or what would have been more likely, um, everyday readers would have bought books and other things to read from newsstands, uh, street stalls and, and itinerant street vendors. But most Americans didn't live in big cities. Um, uh, in the 19th century, the, the, the United States would not have a majority urban population until about 1915. 
most Americans would never have had the experience of setting foot in a books only retail outlet, uh, either like Peterson's and Appleton's or even a store like this. So if you lived in a small town or on a farm, where and how would you have bought books? Um, a lot of people bought books through the mail. Their uh, publishers advertised in newspapers and, and magazines and you could have ordered books from them. Uh, you could have bought books from traveling canvassers that like the, the people I talked about a bit, a bit earlier. But it's not surprising that in small towns, people bought a lot of books from general stores um, or some other mixed purpose retail outlet. A ledger book held at the American Antiquarian Society from Howland Rogers, who were merchants operating in Leicester, Massachusetts in the late 1840s. Uh, and this is just sort of a, a local general store type business, features entries for an astonishing array of goods. Gingham cravats, mittens, lace and ribbons of all varieties, butcher knives, teaspoons, brass candlesticks, wallets, shoes. But they're also selling Webster's Dictionary, Emerson's Arithmetic, Almanacs, the Polyglot Bible, The Life of Jenny Lind. But then also they're selling Brazil nuts and raisins and pepper sauce and peas and salt and beans that run seamlessly in the ledger back into letter books and blank paper and toy books and Bibles and readers and then back again to hardware. This range of goods was typical of many small town stores where readers would have purchased reading material. And you can, you can look at almost any ledger from any small town merchant in the 19th century and find a similar listing of books alongside uh, other kinds of goods. But what did those retail environments look like? Um, well, unfortunately, we don't really know, in large part because most of these general stores were really dark, uh, and in the early days of photography, um, uh, it was impossible to take interior photographs in those kinds of dark spaces. Um, small town stores wouldn't have had gas lights. So these photographs are from the late 19th or early 20th century, um, at the point which interior lighting had improved, but the physical layout of general stores hadn't changed that much from uh, 1850 um, to this point. Um, so here's another uh, image of, uh, of a sort of general all-purpose store. Um, and so while we can't see books in either of these images, although there's this little circular rack here on the left that looks like it maybe has postcards in it, it's not, it's not clear. Um, I'm willing to bet almost anything that, that each of these shops sold books. Um, and here's a, a great image from the uh, Antiquarian Society showing the interior of a, a bookshop in Chicago in 1880. Um, it shows that it looked very much like uh, bookshops from 50 years before. There's the counter, the shelves, the, the clerks are in front of the, the shelves. This was a shop that specialized in Scandinavian uh, books for Chicago's growing immigrant population. Um, and some small towns like Fulton, Maine, um, uh, here, oh, shown here in 1884, were able to support a bookstore. You see the sign for the bookstore there above the, the tin shop. Um, but it's also worth noting that this bookstore went out of business in 1886, so only two years after this, um, this picture was taken. Um, so the other alternative for, for rural or small town residents would have been um, uh, traveling book agents or in urban areas buying things from street peddlers. Um, the retail interaction with these sidewalk vendors or traveling peddlers would have featured neither variety nor informed commentary uh, on the books, but rather convenience and generally low cost. And one important thing to keep in mind about general stores like these um, uh, is that almost none of the goods would have had prices and that would have in included books. Um, uh, things that uh, were sold in stores like this had pricing codes on them instead of actual prices. So only the shopkeepers knew, um, knew how much things cost and I'm happy to talk more in the Q&A about how that worked. So one of the most important and underappreciated aspects of what we now call the first paperback revolution in the 19th century when cheap books first started appearing with paper covers is that those covers quite frequently had uh, the price on them. And you see here on the cover of The Debtor's Daughter, it says price 25 cents. But most books that were printed uh, in the 19th century that came in publishers case bindings had no prices on them. And so if you were in a small town general store, you would have needed to ask how much a book cost. Um, and as I'm sure many of us have experienced, there's often a deep embarrassment associated with asking the price of something and then realizing that it's more than we can afford. So the main takeaway here is that most 19th century Americans who bought books would never have done so in the kind of retail environment that late century booksellers promoted as the ideal bookshop, the sort of place that, that bears the closest resemblance to our contemporary local independent bookstore. Instead, they would have bought them in retail spaces where they were part of a promiscuous assortment of all different kinds of goods, more like uh, a condensed version of Target than um, uh, an independent bookstore. 
So let's go back to the urban booksellers. What about these 10 uh, leading booksellers in Columbus in 1899? Surely at least some of these stores would have offered the bookstore experience outlined in the book trade press uh, from that precise era. One characterized by comprehensive variety, logical arrangements, and a long dedication to the book trade on the part of the bookseller. Except as we have seen, three of them were cigar stands. One of them was a barber shop. Uh, but what of J.F. Ridenauer, who the author of the bookseller article described as the most enterprising bookseller in Columbus? Well, according to Columbus City Directories, James Frank Reidner did indeed own a bookstore in 1899 where he sold books. He was born in Ohio in 1850. He sold stationery, periodicals, and photographic supplies. The only problem is that 1899 is virtually the only year that J.F. Reidner was in the bookselling business. He began his career as a bookkeeper, working for insurance companies and buggy manufacturers uh, into the early 1890s. He then went into partnership with a man named Henry Morgan, selling men's hats uh, and clothes from 1893 to 1897. In 1898, his name was linked with a publishing firm, uh, which appears to have published only two books that are still held in libraries anywhere. Then out of nowhere in 1899, he is the most enterprising bookseller in Columbus. According to the, the 1900 census, he was a produce merchant. Uh, his name was linked to another bookstore in 1901, but after that, he appears in city directories as a bookkeeper, cashier, or treasurer for various Columbus businesses. Customers may well have experienced his large basement store as the type of bookstore that writers like Raoul hoped to encourage. But it also seems like they didn't buy very many books from him since he was only in business for a year and a half. And it's also just as likely that customers thought of it as the store that sold books that was run by the guy who used to sell hats and shirts. They didn't know that in a year he would be selling produce, but they really shouldn't have been surprised. In contrast, the Cincinnati News Company, and this is a, a flyer that's in the, the James scrapbook, um, looks the way Growl says a retail bookstore ought to look. You know, big sidewalk frontage, large display windows, no basement business here, variety of publications. But when customers went inside this, this bookstore, um, they would not have met with the orderly retail environment that Grohl and other books or other booksellers prescribed. Rather, and this is the back of the same flyer, um, the store was filled with precisely the wide assortment of random goods that these aspiring professional booksellers hated. A customer could very easily visit this shop frequently and buy a lot of different stuff without ever buying a book, despite the fact that the business's promotional literature and the city's business directory describe it as a bookstore. While the front windows might look the way that Growl says bookstore windows ought to look, the back of this flyer makes clear that the experience of being inside the shop would not have been terribly different from that of being inside a small town general store that sold books promiscuously placed alongside flour and hammers and frying pans. And just, you can look at the huge variety of goods that uh, you could buy in the store. And a lot of them have, are related to writing, you know, so there's pens and stationery, but a lot of it is just sort of random, uh, random consumer goods. So this raises the question that motivated my interest in this topic from the beginning. What makes something a bookstore? And when do book buyers begin to have specific expectations about what that word means? We can learn a lot from the study of bookstores in the past. Yet the reality of economic practice in the book trade, uh, most notably on the retail end, was rarely neat enough to limit our examinations to a tidy category of enterprises called bookstores. Um, you know, we clearly need to also be paying attention to cigar stands and barbershops and grocery stores. Anybody who's been in a bookstore recently is aware that even the most independent neighborhood bookstore sells a wide range of non-book related material, coffee mugs, stuffed animals, uh, all kinds of stuff. Since their first appearance in North American stores, books have often found themselves placed on store shelves next to other non-book materials. Booksellers would like to assure us that books are special that they're not like other goods. And as readers, we tend to agree. And to reflect more on my, my own daily work of overseeing a research library of pre-1900 Americana, I think that people in the library world, because we're people who love books, have tended to let those feelings color how we build collections. We look for diaries and journals and letters where people talk about books, where they mention what they read. Um, dealers highlight those materials to librarians and we pay more money for them because they in some way confirm our own belief that books are special. 
But when we look back and actually study how people bought things to read, as well as what kinds of physical, physical things they actually read, it becomes more apparent that while books are exceptional in their capacity to survive uh, as material items, in the world of everyday life for many Americans 150 years ago, books may not have been that special at all. What I've tried to suggest is that for consumers in 19th century America, the experience of buying books would, was often exactly like the experience of buying other goods, whether shoes or nails or butter. Thinking of the trade in books as somehow distinct from the trade in things that shared self, shelf space next to them is to perhaps misunderstand the role that print played in every reader's everyday lives. Thanks, and I'm happy to take questions. I'll stop sharing my screen. Hi there. That was great. Thank you so much. And we have lots of comments in the chat. Uh, so it's been fun to, to look at those. Thank you everyone for sharing and for some um, quick wit and amusing notes as well. And we have a lot of questions. So we'll get to those in just a moment. I'll give you um, a break while I just mention a couple of other upcoming events. Next month, we uh, will host uh, Cynthia Matzenbecker as um, a collector's talk. She'll be talking about women in photographs. So that's on March 18th. Everyone who's registered for the Bookworm, um, since it's a monthly event, you'll receive a email next month reminding you about the bookworm and you can choose to join us live or if you're unavailable we will send out a recording um, via email later in the day so mentioning that later this afternoon you will receive any resources mentioned in today's broadcast along with a copy of the recording I also want to mention that we're finally dipping our toes back into some in-person events and we'll have more of these um, coming up this spring as well. The first one is um, at the Saginaw Art Museum. So on March 10th from two to four, we'd love to have you join us in Saginaw to, uh, for a special event where we'll have some mini lectures, uh, some opportunity to talk with the interns who put together our online exhibit and then took that online exhibit to the Saginaw Art Museum as a physical exhibit. Um, and we'll also have a chance to have a tour of some of the other related materials at the Saginaw Art Museum. So please sign up for that and let us know that you'll be attending and I will also, of course, mention that if you would like to sponsor a future episode of the Clemens Bookworm, please contact me or Anne. And now we'll take some questions. <clears throat> okay, so I noticed, Paul, I was keeping an eye on the questions as we went along. And you might have answered this a little bit at the end, but I noticed that people were trying to puzzle out, especially after our poll, when so many people indicated how important books are to them, this idea of why don't we support bookstores a little better? And you start, you hinted at that at the uh -huh. end of, of your talk. Do you have any other thoughts? Um. And that's a huge question, um, and it goes to, you know, long-term changes in American business and American retailing, as well as changes in um, in how we buy things and what how cheap we expect things to be. I think that's a big part of it. Um, uh, so I don't have any great answers to that question. I think it's it's not just it's not just bookstores. So small retailers of all kinds, uh, as as we all know, have um, uh, disappeared over over the years. Hardware stores and you know, bakeries and um, lots of different retail sectors have been influenced in the same way. And it's because it's I think it's because people like convenience. Um, uh, they like low prices. They like knowing that they can get exactly what they want and not having to wait for it. Um, so it's 
it's a lot of uh, different factors that come into play. Um, but it's a great question, you know, for for a country where lots of people say that books are really important um, and that and the books are really central to how we think of ourselves, um, we don't value bookstores all that much. Um, I, I think part of it may be that um, people, a lot of people maybe haven't had good experiences in bookstores. Uh, you know, I, I loved going to bookstores as a kid. I love going to bookstores now, but I'm from a privileged background. I'm the sort of person who bookstores are kind of designed for. And I think there are a lot of people who maybe don't have that experience in bookstores. And so they don't feel um, uh, feel as comfortable going into bookstores. I think the, the question of especially um, customers prioritizing low prices, you see that happening in the late 19th century when, when big department stores um, start establishing book departments. Um, and they were pricing books really low to serve kind of as loss leaders to get people into the store to their stores to buy other things. Um, and publishers, there was a, it's a much longer history than I can go into here and I don't know enough about it. Um, but there were, there were huge fights between department stores and um, the publishing industry about how department stores were pricing books because um, they were undercutting other retailers. Oh, interesting. Yes. So... Definitely a, a complicated question that we could research and talk a lot more about. Um, so we have some questions related to libraries as well, which um, you know people are wondering if if libraries shaped what people were reading um, and how that might have interplayed with the mm -hmm. retail. They, uh, yeah, they certainly did. Um, they shaped, um, they shaped the books that people um, wanted, and and often, um, you know, especially public libraries, I think, felt pressure to provide people with a certain kind of books. And so, library history is its is its own field, and um, uh, I'm not well-versed enough in it to talk uh, in great detail about the history of American libraries. Um, I would recommend anybody who's interested in uh, these questions in more depth to look at the um, uh, five volume history of the book in America series um, that was put out by the American Antiquarian Society and University of North Carolina Press, which has just a, a, a huge collection of great essays on, on sort of specific details of um, uh, book history in the United States. But yes, libraries had a huge uh, impact on uh, on what people read and what they what they wanted to read, but they only stocked a certain kind of books. Um, a lot of libraries were reluctant, for instance, to have fiction um, because they thought uh, librarians and the people who ran libraries thought that fiction was bad for people um, and that it wasn't edifying. And so it was, you know, they tended to have biographies and works of natural history and um, you know religious works, depending on the the affiliation of the libraries. Um, it's important to keep in mind that organizations of all kinds in the 19th century had libraries. So, you know, we think of maybe school libraries and, and public lending libraries um, as the sort of main institutions of um, in the library world that we think about, but there were um, like volunteer fire companies had sometimes had libraries in their uh, firehouses. I've read uh, minutes from fire companies in Philadelphia where people were being fined for re returning books late. Um, uh, voluntary associations of all kinds had their own libraries. Um, uh, churches had libraries, Sunday schools had libraries. Um, so there were lots of different um, kinds of libraries that, and some of them were focused in very particular ways. Thank you. So there are a few questions about um, thinking about used versus new books. So I think you mentioned a couple of times in your talk that some of the stores sold both. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe just elaborating a little bit on that. But also Tom is mentioning, you know, those bindings are fairly durable and it seems like it's suggested that the books could be used and um, bought and sold. So just some questions around used books. Yeah, they're, um, you know, the, uh, 
hardbound books are durable. Um, and they, because they're durable, I think they've given us a skewed understanding of what people in the past actually read because that, that Timothy Shea Arthur novel that I showed you, The Debtor's Daughter, which is in those tattered paper covers, um, those books weren't meant to last. And so we, um, a lot of people read books in paper covers. A lot of people read books not in book format at all. They read books that were serialized in magazines or newspapers um, uh, and things that were not formatted like books, but they were, that's how they were reading, especially fiction in a lot of cases. So the, the books that survive are not a representative sample of the artifacts that people actually read. Um, so that's the first thing to keep in mind. There, in big cities, there were used bookstores. Um, I, I don't think that it was terribly common for urban bookstores in the United States to sell both. The, the, that London bookstore that I showed, the Temple of the Muses, sold both new and used books. But that's kind of unusual. And, and then big cities in the United States, there tended to be kind of neighborhoods that were where used book dealers tended to uh, cluster. So the best known one is um, Fourth Avenue in New York City. Um, the Strand is the last remaining uh, bookstore from that. What was at one point, you know, there were 40 or 50 used bookstores in a four block stretch uh, um, in that part of Manhattan. So there was a trade in used books. Um, I think it was probably more common for people to um, to loan books that they'd already read to someone else or to give them away, um, especially if you lived in a small town or on a farm. There, you know, there wasn't enough um, uh, sufficient population density support to support a used bookstore. So you just would have sort of either kept things or given the way, given them away, loaned them out. Um, but in big cities, there there was a used book trade. Thank you. Um, Cheryl has an interesting question, and you even mentioned, um, you know, Sunday school libraries and those kinds of things. But she's saying that she's working on um, 19th century Sunday school publications, oh, okay. and that those were sold through catalogs, um, depository bookstores that stocked and sold them for multiple organizations, but some depositories seem to have been general bookstores. Yep. Were any of the bookstores you examined also selling books from religious organization publishers? And she says that she's arguing that the success of Sunday School Books showed there was a real market for children's books and new publishers by mid-century. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, that, and that's a fantastic question. Uh, and definitely religious publishers were some of the big, biggest publishers in 19th century America, and you can read more about this in the forthcoming issue of the Cordo um, uh, from the Clements Library. Um, and some some of these general uh, you know general stores or other bookstores did sell religious books, books that were produced by um, religious uh, publishers. It sometimes depended on the denominational affiliation of the store owner. So um, if you were a Unitarian, you probably wouldn't sell, um, sell books that were produced by a Presbyterian publisher, for instance. And so, but, you know, some, may, sometimes maybe you would if that's what people in, uh, in your town wanted. Um, Publishers like the American Sunday School Union and the American Tract Society typically had their own distribution networks, um, but that's not to say that they sometimes didn't wind up also being sold in general bookstores. Um, one of the best, um, the best descriptions I've ever read in 19th century fiction of somebody shopping for books is in um, Susan Warner's sentimental novel, The Wide Wide World, where the, um, the main character, Ellen Montgomery, her mother, um, pawns, uh, pawns a, a ring that she inherited from her mother so she can take uh, her daughter shopping for books and stationery. And um, the main thing that she's shopping for is a Bible. And so she, it's this tremendous description of shopping for Bibles in the big bookstore in 19th century New York. Um, it's really amazing. But yeah, those, um, it, the, the complications of denominational book selling and, and the efforts to sort of um, of groups like the American Bible, so Bible Society to sort of cross denominational lines is a really fascinating history um, uh, and really complicated. 
Thank you. So people did notice that you mentioned we could talk more about book pricing. So Doug is su suggesting sure. that. And Georgia, I saw mentioned in the chat that Goodspeeds was using those pricing codes late into the 20th century. Yeah, um, yeah, used booksellers in particular would do it. Um, so book pricing um, was, uh, was complicated. So, you know, publishers printed ads in newspapers and periodicals and put out catalogs that listed prices um, for books. But if you hadn't seen those catalogs, um, you wouldn't necessarily know what the price of a book was unless it was a paper bound thing like the, like the debtor's daughter that said, 15 cents or 25 cents on the cover. Um, which, and, and it's it's impossible to, um, it, to overstate how important that is, that was for readers. Um, you know, for, if you don't know the language, for instance, if you're an immigrant and you don't know English, um, you can still buy a book if the price is on the cover. Like you can probably read 25. Um, uh, but if you're not, you're, it's it's makes the transaction that much uh, more uncomfortable. Um, so the way that small town stores worked, um, those like those general stores that I showed, um, nothing had fixed prices on it. And this is a whole debate in the 19th century retail world about is the fixed price system uh, better or not. Um, uh, but those small town stores would write just the codes on on everything on the shelves. So whether it's axes or fabric or whatever. Um, so that only the people who worked in the store knew the knew the actual price. So they could look at the code and understand what it meant. Um, and they did that for a couple of reasons. One was to keep competitors from knowing how much uh, how much they were charging for things. Um, if there was another store in town, you didn't want the person who ran that store to come in and see, oh, you're selling this fabric for 12 cents a yard. I'm going to sell it for nine. Um, uh, but also so that customers wouldn't know. So that if that gave shopkeepers the flexibility to change how much they charge different people. So if Angela is married to a wealthy local landowner who also owns the sawmill and employs a whole bunch of people, um, and I own the local general store, I know that I'm gonna get more business from Angela and her family than I am from a single person. And so, um, when Angela or someone from her family comes in to buy things in my store, I might price certain things lower knowing that I'm gonna make it up on volume because they're gonna be buying more stuff. Um, uh, so um, shop owners were constantly changing how much um, they charged for things. It was a little harder to do with books later in the 19th century because often um, publishers would start putting ads at the back of their books that included prices. And so people would get mad if, you had charged them $1.50 for a book that was only supposed to cost a dollar. Um, but in general, um, the, the real downward pressure on, on, or downward trend in book prices happens in the 1830s and 40s when things start being republished in paper covers, which is just much, they're much cheaper um, to produce. They weigh less, they're, they're easier to ship. Um, and they usually have the price on the cover. So, um, and books like that, um, you know, that the, the one I showed uh, cost 25 cents, which is pretty typical. Um, a hardbound version of that same book probably would have cost 75 cents or a dollar in the 1840s. So, Thank you. Um, so Tom is thinking about how heavy books are and wondering mm -hmm. if there were special requirements back then for shipping, storing, and displaying the books. Um, there's, uh, I don't know that there were special requirements. I mean, it, lots of stuff was really heavy and people were used to, um, to shipping heavy stuff all the time. Um, there weren't, um, you know, aside from the, the big city bookstores like Peterson's or Appleton's, um, most stores wouldn't have had a huge number of the same kind of book. It's not until later in the 19th century that you get, you know, the huge stacks of multiple copies of the same book um, uh, in bookstores that, um, that we're kind of used to now. But yeah, shipping books was uh, was heavy. They would have been typically packed in big crates uh, and uh, shipped by 
rail and then by steamboat and uh, then on wagons, depending on where you were. Um, they were hard to hard to move around. So you know, earlier in the nineteenth in the eighteenth and early nineteenth century, um, books were most often shipped in sheets uh, and then were bound. Um, you would have them bound when you bought them. Um, so the, the introduction of the the case bind, the publisher's case binding. So the the binding that's created and put on by the publisher um, comes in the you know the eighteen thirties and forties. Um, uh, but yeah, books are books are heavy. They're a pain in the neck to move around. They're a pain to store. Um, uh, it, but it's not that different from from uh, you know right now. Yesterday on Twitter, I saw a thread from somebody who owns a bookstore and was making fun of you know how everybody says, "Oh, isn't it great to own a bookstore? It must be so fun." And she's like, "Yeah, I, I carried 150 cases of books upstairs today, so it's really great owning a bookstore." <laughs> <clears throat> yes, exactly. Um, so Howard is thinking about um, the encyclopedias by subscription and those kinds of things and wondering when that came into being as a way for getting books. So the whole multi-volume encyclopedia um, subscription is largely a 20th century phenomenon. What you, um, what you have in the 19th century are publishers that specialize in selling books by subscription. Um, and this is um, especially uh, a post-Civil War phenomenon, although there were subscriptions, certainly uh, subscription books sold much earlier in the 19th century. Um, and how it typically worked was that you would, um, a, the publisher would cre create a prospectus. So typically um, a sample version of the book. And we have a fair number of these in the collection of the Clements that with the sample cover probably a table of contents, the frontispiece, a, maybe a sample chapter, maybe some examples of engravings if it's going to be an illustrated book. Um, and then examples of different the different bindings that you could get it in. Uh, typically, there would be different spines pasted in at the back. So you could get cloth binding or different kinds of leather and they would all uh, cost different prices. Um, and traveling agents would go around and um, solicit subscriptions for the book. And so you would sign your name on the printed form in the back of the book and say, yes, I will buy a copy of this book when it, um, when it becomes available. And then, um, and then when the book was ready, you, you would, uh, it would be delivered and you'd pay for it. So. Thank you. Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know enough about the sort of, you know, the, what we think of as like the traveling encyclopedia salesman who comes to your door and convinces you to sign up to get five years worth of giant encyclopedia volumes. Um, Carol is wondering if you know if any of the bookstores that that you showed pictures of if their buildings are still standing. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. Um, there are a few 19th century bookstore buildings that I think uh, that are still around. Um, Maybe the best known is the the old corner bookstore in Boston, um, which uh, was the for a long time uh, Jamie Fields's uh, bookstore um, of uh, Fields and Osgood, and, and now is it was a map store for a long time, and now I think it's a Chipotle. So, um, um, but uh, but I don't know if any of the other. Um, uh, buildings that I showed are still around. I, I'd be surprised. But I know there are some around the country. Yeah, Kristen is mentioning that um, 25 Fulton Street in Manhattan, where the William Swain books um, was, is still standing. Okay. So. Uh, so let's see. So Rex, we, we talked a little bit about the the peddlers mm -hmm. so i don't know if you know if how many different kinds of ways of peddling books there were but rex is mentioning that um that he saw at the national museum of american jewish history in independence hall in philadelphia that they had a lively history of immigrant jewish peddlers mm -hmm. um on you know in their exhibits and just wondering um 
more about the itinerant booksellers and any um, other scholarship on them. Yeah, you know, I don't know that uh, of any scholarship on the uh, ethnic makeup of um, traveling book canvassers. Typically, um, the 19th century canvassers that that I've read about um, were typically young men. Um, uh, it was not, you know, um, not a job that you did for 30 years, um, typically, but was for sort of young, ener energetic people. I think the um, the peddlers that Rex is talking about um, are probably a later 19th and early 20th century phenomenon um, where they were um, peddling sort of all, all different kinds of goods um, and kind of uh, similar to the the earlier trope of the Yankee peddler, um, you know, people who went around with, with wagons full of all kinds of stuff and would go to farms um, and rural communities and sell. It was like a traveling general store, essentially. Um, uh, and they certainly would have had books um, uh, that they sold. I don't know that, um, know of any particular um, role that Jewish peddlers had in, in, in sort of traveling book peddling. And this, you know, this, this itinerant um, book selling is a really longstanding thing in American history. I mean, uh, Parson Weems, who wrote the famous um, uh, mostly fictional biography of Washington was a traveling bookseller. He was a, a Methodist minister who traveled around uh, mostly in the sort of the mid-Atlantic and uh, upper South selling books. Um, so that model was around for a long time. Um, but in terms of the book canvassers, you know, people who were working for a publisher selling a specific book or mul multiple books, um, uh, I don't know that there's, you know, that they were associated with a particular ethnicity, but Garrett, I saw just posted something on, um, uh, itinerant booksellers that will probably be a much more useful source than I am. Thanks, Garrett. And and yeah, thanks for those comments, um, Paul. Uh, I love all of the, the questions that people are asking today because this presentation has made them think about how all of these things are interconnected and all of the different um, ways that, that, that books are moving around. So Elizabeth is wondering if you happen to know when booksellers were able to start returning books to the publisher and get a refund. The, the curse of the publishing industry. Um, so, so for people who don't know about returns, the way that um, the publishing is different from most other industries is that if, you, if a publisher, um, prints a bunch of copies of a book and uh, they get sent to bookstores and they don't sell books, the bookstores can send them back um, and get their money back, um, which doesn't hap doesn't work happen with any other category of goods. I mean, if a store buys too many of a certain style of shoes and nobody wants them, they just get marked down 75% um, and then they throw out what they don't sell, but um, publishing doesn't work that way. And it has, it. Um, that's a very long-standing model, um, and there's there's great scholarship on this in the history of the book in America series um, that that describes how that came into being. But it was uh, it was the case um, for a lot of the 19th century, and there's a, um, a famous story of about the publisher Frank Doubleday, who was playing golf with I think Andrew Carnegie, um, and uh, Carnegie was asking him, "Well, so how much?" Um, uh, how much money did you make last quarter? Um, and Doubleday says, well, I, I don't know because you know, bookstores send books back to us. And so we don't really know how much money we made. Uh, we don't really know how many assets assets we have. And Carnegie's just dumbfounded. It's like, how like how can you run an industry this way? Um, so it's it's a situation of longstanding. Um, but the the HBA um, volumes will have good scholarship on how that actually came to be. Thank you. Um, Virginia and Meredith have somewhat related questions about paperback books. I know you mentioned that they, um, you know, the, the hardbound ones are the ones that survive more readily, but that people were really reading these, these um, paperback and newsprint books. So she's wondering when, when did they really become widely available? 
-hmm. So that's part of the question. And then the other question is, you know, how, how can we um, encourage scholars to take those um, uh, paperback books more seriously from the 19th century and, and do mm -hmm. more scholarship on them? Well, Meredith McGill knows way more about that than I do. So, um, <laughs> um, uh, paperbacks um, become available, uh, you know, really in the 1830s, first as paperback reprints of um, European books, um, uh, and then reprints of books by American authors, and then, um, you know, in the late 30s and, and 1840s, you start seeing things that are, you know, first appear in in paper wrappers um so um that happens pretty early and it lowers the price of books significantly and makes them available to a much wider range of readers um i you know i think that uh, uh well this is something meredith and i have talked about before i think it's absolutely important for scholars to take newspapers and pamphlets more seriously as the primary a vector of reading for most Americans. Um, uh, you know, people would read entire novels um, that were printed serially in, in magazines and newspapers. There would be newspaper publishers who just as a stunt would publish an enormous mammoth issue of a newspaper and print an entire novel on, on one issue. And so they could say like, here, you can buy this whole novel for 10 cents because I printed it in this eight foot wide um, single issue of the newspaper. It's it was impossible to read, but it was just sort of like to show that they could do it. Um, and it's that that paperback, um, uh, paperback publishing, I think, and I'm biased because this is the kind of publishing I'm, I'm most interested in, I think really drives most of the innovations in publishing in the mid 19th century. Um, and Meredith's question about um, urbanization is, is interesting. So um, the, the census defined a city as um, any place with more than 2,500 people. So that 1915, 1920 tipping point um, is just when the majority of Americans live in places with more than 2,500 people. But I don't think that we would really consider a town of 2,500 people to be a city, but that's when that was the metric that was being used in the census. So. Thanks. Uh, we still have some really great questions. I noticed Michael, he's it's um, one part comment and you did talk about this a little bit, but I'll, I'll um, mention this in case you have a few more mm -hmm. ideas. He says that he's researching John Russell Bartlett, um, Bartlett and Welford Astor House, New York. And mm -hmm. he's curious as to whether or not the business was failing when he decided to tip his toe into politics. Was it too expensive a storefront? Are there indications as to why 19th century bookstores succeeded or failed? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, and I uh, don't know enough about Bartlett um, to say specifically, although um, since his shop was in the Astor House, that was some of the most expensive retail um, real estate in New York. So you would have had to sell a lot of books um, uh, to, to keep going there, even if it was a small space. Um, you know, I, I think 19th century bookstores succeeded or failed um, kind of for the same reasons that. 19th century businesses of all kinds succeeded or failed. And a lot of it had to do with um, the cycle of economic uh, downturns that you know plagued the 19th century. So if you opened a store, um, you would have largely been dependent on credit. Um, you would have you know, had uh, bought the stock to your store um, with things that you bought on credit. And if the economy tanked, um, which happens with remarkable frequency in the 19th century and people didn't have enough money to buy stuff, you were you would go bankrupt. Um, so that I think drove a lot of it. Some of it was, um, you know, the just the usual reasons the places went out of uh, went out of business or or didn't. Um, you know, they were in a good location. Um, they had uh, uh, 
you know, especially for bookstores, if they had um, some connection to a particular community. So, um, you know, like the immigrant bookstore from Chicago that I showed or particular um, bookstores that maybe had specific denomination, religious denominational connections um, that always helped people uh, keep going. It, it was, you know, then as now, it was hard to keep a bookstore in business, I think. Definitely, yes. Um, Linda's wondering when the focus on children and children's books begins. Um, oh, well, there is um, a great, a great history, um, great scholarship on the history of American children's books. Um, you know, people like Pat Crane and, and Karen Sanchez Epler um, have done really fantastic work on this. And, and again, I would refer people to the HBA volumes for um, as a point of entry. Um, Alexander Anderson, who was um, one of the one of the first really important American wood engravers, starts um, a a shop of children's books in New York in I think the late 1790s, if I'm not mistaken. It's a very, very uh, 1790s or very early 19th century. So, um, I mean, there are people who are thinking of children as a specific audience for books. Um, uh, quite early on. Um, I, I'm really fascinated by, by early American children's books, um, uh, I, which I've learned so much about from my former colleague, Laura Wasowitz at the Antiquarian Society, uh, the curator of children's books there. Um, you know, a lot of early children's books are produced by religious publishers. So people like the American Tract Society and, and the Sunday School Union. Um, and there is wide, <laughs> wide variety and um, and what children's books were like and what people thought was suitable for children to read and, and um, what lessons people thought children's books should try to communicate. Um, but there, um, it happened, you know, the, the production of books for, chil for children as a specific kind of reader happens pretty early. I mean, even, even before Anderson, things like the New England Primer, and, you know, educational books are pitched to child readers. Right. Um, there's some uh, uh, more conversation about libraries and, and Frances Olson is wondering, she's noticing that um, libraries are encouraging more online options and she's wondering what's going to happen to uh, all the paper resources and wondering what you think about that. <laughs> uh, that is a question way, uh, way out of my wheelhouse. I, I mean, it's a huge, um, it's a question for libraries of all kinds, for university libraries and schools and, and public libraries. Um, yeah, what what are libraries going to do with um, with all the hard copies that they have? A lot of libraries, uh, as anybody who works in um, universities know, have are really trying to stop buying hard copies of books if they can get electron, electronic copies of them um, and are dedicating space in libraries on campuses to other things, um, to you know, student reading spaces, maker spaces, collaborative work spaces. Um, and uh, as anybody who has had, um, had the task of having to clear out a family member's home after they have downsized or, or passed away, um, one of the biggest, hardest questions is what do you do with all those books? Um, because it is, whether it's for individuals or, or institutions, getting rid of, uh, of a lot of old books is a huge challenge. Um, and there's this idea that like, oh, we'll just, we'll offer them to somebody for free and somebody will want, like, it's, it's very hard to even give books away. Right. Yes. As we were discussing earlier, they certainly take up space. So, um, yeah, it's a, there are definitely some, some good and bad things about that. Of course, I'm sure we could all debate that for the rest of the day. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, I was reading something yesterday about the, um, the espresso book machine, this print on demand machine that had a sort of brief glimmer of, um, hype around it, I don't know, 15 years ago or so. Um, it's the idea that in, when you went into a bookstore, instead of a bookstore having to keep 
multiple copies on hand of, of all the books they thought they might sell, they would just have, uh, they could have this, uh, uh, this machine, which is essentially a high-speed combined printer and binder, and, and you could order something to be printed on demand while you waited. You know, it would take five minutes or something like that. Um, and there was hope that this was going to transform the world of book selling and it was going to make backlist books um, much more saleable and it was going to change publishers business model but it never really caught on the machines were too expensive and um, uh, I think hard to maintain but it was for a while people thought that was going to be the solution that you would just get one one copy of the book that you wanted instead of wow yeah um so Lynn is wondering about what the role of books uh, was in distribution of big ideas in the 1800s, especially in the rural and the Midwest. Um, she's thinking about things like uh, Darwin's Origin of Species or other, you know, really big ideas like that. Right. Um, well, you know, books were how people, how a lot of people learned about those big questions and those debates. Um, and it's, um, uh, you know, it goes back to the very founding of the United States and well before, um, you know, books are the primary vector of intellectual history um, for much of this country's history. Um, and so whether it's, you know, um, the Declaration of Independence, I mean, that is, that's circulated, um, in print, uh, and then it gets printed different places, and people read it, and that's how uh, those those ideas spread. Um, you know, certainly, you can look at the abolitionist movement as having been um, a set of ideas that was spread and spread primarily through print. Whether uh, it's David Walker's appeal, um, uh, you know, which was distributed to African American readers or Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is you know pitched primarily to um, to a more middle middle class white white readership, um, you know something like Origin of the Species probably was not itself that widely read, but the printed debate about it and especially printed attacks against it were pretty widely circulated, um, both in newspapers and magazines um, and as well as in book form. So. Um, yeah, certainly, um, certainly were, books were incredibly important for the spread of those ideas, although it's, uh, it's important to remember that, that things like public lectures were also uh, important forms of entertainment in the 19th century, and that was often the way that uh, ideas got spread. So somebody like Emerson, um, there are probably a lot more people who saw Emerson lecture than read Emerson's books. Um, so. I don't know how you how you parse out the role of print and the spread of those ideas because he wouldn't been wouldn't have been giving the lectures if he hadn't written the the books he was talking about. Right. Thank you. Um, Anne is mentioning that Elizabeth Peabody was both a bookstore owner and a publisher whose store also served as a literary salon in Boston, and she's just wondering if you know about similar stores in other big cities. Oh, and this question makes me so happy. Elizabeth Palmer Peabody is one of my very favorite 19th century book world uh, figures. And um, she's so fascinating. I don't know of anybody who's, ex who's quite like her. I mean, she was very well, you know, very well socially connected in uh, the New England literary world um, uh, and also extremely well educated and so yeah she had um, a bookstore in Boston that was sort of a, um, a central node of the network of transcendentalists and had this famous salon that she um, that she ran there and she also uh, was an author and had really fascinating ideas for how especially how world history should be taught um, uh, she's a really really interesting person there I don't know of other people who combined all of the different things that she did in quite the same way, although there probably were, and I just don't know about them. Um, there were certainly literary salons, um, a lot of them uh, sort of organized by women in, in other cities in the 19th century US. Um, 
I don't know of a ton that were that were also structured around bookstores. Um, Elizabeth Peabody's kind of, as far as I know, a little bit different, but um, I would love to know more about what was happening in other places. Thanks, Ann. Thanks for that question. Yeah. There's, we're approaching 1130, but I'll try to group a couple of them together because there's some interesting questions about, um, you know, immigrants, minorities, for people who aren't speaking English, um, people who weren't literate, and, you know, how they might have interacted with the book trade. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, very, very early in um, the history of printing in, in what is now the United States, things are being printed in other languages. Um, so that was, um, that was sort of a strand, an important strand in uh, American publishing from the very beginning. Um, and, you know, the thing that I always point to is that the first, um, the first complete Bible printed in what is now the United States is not printed in English, it's printed in Wampanoag. Um, uh, so, um, the, you know, missionary efforts were really crucial um, to uh, printing things in other languages from, you know, very early on, there's a lot of German language printing in places like Pennsylvania, where there are um, large numbers of German immigrants. Um, so there's, there's both a lot of printing in uh, other languages in the United States and also the importation of, of books from Europe um, for, for multilingual audiences. So that's a really important um, strand in, uh, in American publishing. And then over the course of the 19th century in particular, the real, um, the really significant uh, sort of upswell is in foreign language newspapers um, uh, for, for immigrant communities. And you see that happening, you know, uh, pretty early in the 19th century. Um, Certainly in Louisiana, there are news, there are these great trilingual newspapers that are printed in French and Spanish and English, and um, so yeah, that that's ha that happens a lot. Yeah, and this this is another area we mentioned before. Some areas that that could use more uh, scholarship. Uh, the Clement certainly has lots of um, materials in a whole variety of languages. So right. Yeah, and, and for, you know, now the challenge of scholarship is finding people who read Welsh, you know, for instance, who are interested in Welsh language publishing in the 19th century US. Um, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of really fascinating material that doesn't get enough attention because, um, because of the language skills. Um, okay, so... We still have people thinking a little sure. bit about the industry itself and wondering if, um, you know, that best, those bestseller lists, when did they start sort of driving um, book sales? Oh, um, you know, I don't know when the first bestseller list starts. Um, I would guess probably early, you know, early 20th century. Um, uh, the the idea of the category of the bestseller is a really fascinating thing and um, uh, sort of how that fits or doesn't fit with different 19th century books is a really interesting question. Um, there is in the late 19th century, um, there are a lot of periodic book trade um, periodicals and magazines um, that are trying to gather information for people in publishing and, and uh, book selling um and it then sort of there's a lot of competition then and then publishers weekly kind of emerges as the standard um uh periodical trade publication um for the book trade um but a lot of the the work that adolf Grohl was doing at publishers weekly um and this is sort of a constant sisyphean quest uh over a lot of the 19th century is people were always trying to to keep track of like just what was being published uh, in the United States because nobody knew. And so, um, you know, they're trying to go through publishers catalogs and, and write to publishers and find out like, what, what have you printed so that I can uh, put like create a gigantic book of like all the books that were printed in the United States last year. Um, and it was, it drove people crazy. It was impossible to do. Interesting. Um, 
but the idea of of bestsellers is a really um, is a really interesting one. Publishers were always saying, uh, on especially on the covers of paper uh, cover novels, making extraordinary claims about how many copies of a particular book had sold. Um, so. Uh, one of the books that I've worked on a lot, uh, George Lepard's Quaker City, which is a sensational novel about um, Philadelphia, the, those, the publisher of that book was constantly saying, oh, the, you know, now and it's, um, you know, uh, 500,000 copies printed um, and or 38th edition, like there, I, there were not 37 previous editions of that book. People were just making stuff up all the time to talk about how, how many <laughs> copies of books have been sold. Right. Um, Kristen's wondering, uh, we've talked about a lot of different places that books were sold and she's wondering about book selling in train stations. When it, did that also start in the 1800s? Oh yeah, yeah. And there's um, actually really um, some really fascinating scholarship on railway reading and what people read on trains, what, um, and what things were available to buy at train stations. Um, so you could, there were, newsstands and bookstalls at train stations, but also um, you could buy things to read on the train. So there would be, you know, um, vendors going up and down the aisles selling newspapers and other stuff to read. So, and that's, that sort of starts with rail travel. I mean, it is sort of instantaneous. Okay, thank you. Um, Graham's wondering um, if there were differences between cities in the South and the North, both before and after the Civil War. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a really big question. The short answer is yes, a lot. Um, uh, there certainly were um, bookstores and street vendors and um, uh, lots of different kinds of booksellers in Southern cities. Um, before and after the Civil War, the the big question, the the main issue is is size. So Southern cities, um, Charleston and New Orleans, grow at about the same rate as other as Northern cities do until, well, in the case of Charleston, maybe about eighteen fifty. New Orleans kind of keeps growing, um, but Char then Charleston just stops. Uh, you know, like in in 1780 Charleston's the fourth biggest city in North America, something like that. And then at a certain point, it just stops growing. New Orleans keeps getting big, but not as fast as places like New York and St. Louis and Philadelphia and Chicago. Um, so it's in terms of the book trade, it's just it's largely a function of size. Um, uh, how many bookstores they supported. Um, but certainly lots of a vibrant newspaper culture in lots of southern cities. Thank you. And our last question is, um, Tom is thinking about maps in bookstores. Did they always oh. carry maps and, um, you know, what kinds of special arrangements for display might you know a, about? That's a great question, Tom. And I don't really, um, I don't really know. I think typically, you know, so large, you know, expensive maps would have been sold by map dealers rather than in general purpose bookstores, because um, they would have been kind of for a specialized audience and would have cost a lot of money. Um, but one thing that general bookstores, especially in cities would have had were things like city directories and visitors guides that would have often had maps included in them. Um, you know, so if, especially if you say a news, news stand at a train station, if you were visiting Philadelphia and you took the train there, you could buy a visitor's guide to Philadelphia at the train station that would have had a map in it. Um, but the sort of big, um, big really detailed um, elaborate maps of the kind that the, the Clements has such a great collection of, um, you probably wouldn't have bought those at a, at a general bookstore. Thank you, thanks. Um, I noticed that Judith is asking about a list of independent bookshops in Michigan um, uh, for traveling purposes. Uh, I don't know if we have a good source of that, but we can look around and think about that, unless you know one, Paul. I do not, but I'm, uh, I'm sure there is a state association of booksellers that maintains such a list, although it's just like can say that um, a lot of the ones you can find are out of date. Yes. So, 
Okay, well, thank you, everybody. This was wonderful, wonderful presentation, Paul, and such great questions and um, conversation afterwards, lots of food for thought. So, yeah. Um, and Angela, do we want to announce the um, our March 21st event? Or? Uh, March 21st, we, yes, we can do that as well. Okay. We um, will be hosting uh, Honoré Jeffers and in person, it's a hybrid event in person and via live stream. So we will send out the registration for that with our email later today. And hopefully everyone will sign up and um, it should be a great program. Thanks for coming, everybody. Yes, yes. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for coming. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.